for the top of the news. Getting the first dramatic testimony in the Colorado movie theater massacre now. And a hearing that could mean the difference between life and death for the suspect in this crime, James Holmes. Prosecutors say they'll decide after the, uh, this goes on whether to decide the, to go for the death penalty after this week's proceedings. Today in court, prosecutors are for the first time giving a detailed indication of exactly what happened during the chilling crime. How they say the suspect ambushed a sold-out screening of the new Batman movie back in July, tossing can gas canisters filled with choking smoke and shooting panicked moviegoers as they tried to make an escape. In all, they say the shooter killed 12 people and wounded dozens more. And before today's hearings, prosecutors warned victims' families a lot of the testimony will be mighty hard for them to bear. Alicia Acuna with the news. She's live outside the courthouse this afternoon in Centennial, Colorado. Uh, they got off to a very graphic start today, didn't they? They did, Shep. And two veteran police officers broke down in tears on the stand as they described in detail today the scene that they came upon uh, once the shooting stopped. Aurora police officer Justin Grizzle testified that as he went into Theater 9, he found people screaming, help us, help us. He heard cell phones going off, ringing and ringing, he says. He explained, and an alarm. Officer Grizzle choked up. When it came to the moment, he recalled when another officer carried seven-year-old Veronica Moser Sullivan to him. She is the youngest victim. The courtroom was silent as he tried to compose himself, describing handing her off to be taken outside. According to Grizzle and a sergeant on scene, they decided to start taking victims to hospitals via their own patrol cars because ambulances were not on scene yet. Now, once this testimony was complete, there were family members and victims in the courtroom. They were hugging the officers and crying and thanking them. Holmes sat in the courtroom today with no expression. Shep. What did they say about that suspect, Holmes, Alicia? Well, the officers also described coming upon a scene in which they thought they saw a fellow law enforcement officer, someone in a helmet and a gas mask. But as that person who was standing in front of a car just stood there doing nothing amidst all of the chaos, they realized it was something different completely, and they moved in to arrest James Holmes, who was head to toe in body armor. Officer Grizzle testified that he asked Holmes, who's helping you? Officer Grizzle says Holmes looked at me and smiled. The prosecutor asks, what kind of smile? Officer Grizzle answers like a smirk. They have described Holmes during these moments as being very, very relaxed, as being very calm, staring off into the district distance and not reacting normally. Shep. Alicia Acuna at the Courthouse Centennial, Colorado this afternoon. Alicia, thank you. So what's this hearing really all about? Judge Andrew Napolitano is with us now. He's our Fox News senior judicial analyst. This, this isn't the trial. This is no, no, this is, a, this is a preliminary hearing. I mean, no, normally the state doesn't want to hold a hearing like this because they basically have to show their cards. They have to put on the stand their witnesses and present their evidence, and the, the defense can cross-examine it to prove to the judge that they have a, a case, that they have enough evidence to require the court to summon a jury and to force the defendant to go through a trial. They don't have to prove the case. They have to demonstrate that they have reliable, credible evidence lawfully obtained, which, if believed by a jury could convict him. Well, why would the state do this, you yeah. might ask? Because the state may not want to try this case. The state may want to persuade the defendant and his lawyers that he would be best off pleading guilty and going away for the rest of his life rather than exposing himself to this horrific, horrendous, gut-wrenching testimony and risking being um, uh, condemned to death. And, and it, this is not a matter of anything else, but do you spend the rest of your life in prison or do you get the death penalty? And I guess for the jury, the most what they have to decide now is what his mental state is. Not now, but at the moment he was committing these crimes. Right. There is no jury in the courtroom. They have not yet been summoned or, or even called. We don't know who the jurors would be or even if, if there will be jurors. There's just the judge there. So there's a, there's a couple of uh, forces at play here. The defense wants to see how strong the state's case is. The state is happy to let the defense see how strong it is. The state would like the case to be so strong that the defendant doesn't want to go through this again and will plead guilty. The defense lawyers may very well want their own plaintiff to plead guilty because they don't want to go through this. The other way to look at it is this guy is obviously seriously, seriously, seriously disturbed. Can a jury even determine whether or not he was of sound mind at the moment he committed these horrific crimes? It seems almost criminal to even put these families 
after all they've been through to have to hear details that we, we've not even known. We have not, you're right, Shep. We have not heard details. What Alicia reported, as, as, as precise and compelling as it was, is among the most graphic I have ever heard. It's, you can understand why these cops themselves have broken down as they're uh, describing it. So this is yet another factor at play here. Do you really want to force everybody to go through all of this again, or might it be better for all involved if the person who obviously planned and plotted this and pulled the trigger agreed to go away for the rest of his life? Mm -hmm.